Good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to the UCLA CTSI Distinguished Speaker Series in conjunction with the uh, Health Equity and Translational Social Science theme. It gives me great pleasure to introduce to you our three distinguished speakers for today. Uh, they are going to talk, speak with us about inequity in trauma care in Sub-Saharan Africa, opportunities for a multidisciplinary approach, and we are joined today by Kevin Blair. Kevin is one of our residents in surgery here at UCLA doing his research years, three of them. Um, he received his undergraduate degree from Vanderbilt and medical degree from Northwestern. And he right now is earning his master's of science in public health through the London School of Hygiene and Tropical Medicine. His research is funded by the South American Program in HIV Pre Prevention Research, or SAFIRE, and the h, h Lee Surgical Research Grant. So that's Kevin. We also have with us uh, Dr. Katrine Juilliard, who is the co-director of the Program for Advancement of Surgical Equity, Dr. Juilliard is an extraordinary surgeon and researcher. Um, she has just secured a D43 and a U54 written during a pandemic um, with incredible partners that she has in Cameroon. And uh, this has been a long time coming. She has an extraordinary career behind her and an even ex more exceptional one ahead of her. Um, and, uh, and she is a product of UCLA um, in terms of medical school and, um, and her residency program. And she um, had uh, the opportunity to bless me with her presence at UCSF um, as, a as a fellow in trauma and critical care. And now she's back with us as an associate professor at UCLA in trauma and critical care. And then finally, we have Lauren Elizabeth Eiler. Lauren uh, comes from uh, uh, UC Berkeley where she is right now earning her PhD in biostatistics. Um, I got an opportunity to meet Lauren when she was a medical student at UCSF and she went on to start a surgical residency and um, some would say saw the light and is now uh, earning her PhD in biostatistics. Um, and Lauren has uh, a BS from Yale University um, and an MPH also from UC Berkeley. Um, and she is part of this incredible group of a joint initiative for casu casual infer inference, excuse me, from UC Berkeley um, in combination of the University of Copenhagen and uh, Novo Nordisk um, and uh, is a global cancer fellow at UCSF. Um, and is just absolutely exceptionally gifted. So it's fun to see Lauren again, and I'm looking forward to all three of our speakers today. So uh, without further ado, uh, go ahead and take it away. Hi, everybody. Thank you so much for that very generous introduction, Dr. Dicker. Um, my name is Katrine Juilliard and I am a trauma surgeon at UCLA. And uh, I'd just like to thank everyone for the opportunity to share our work with you today. Um, like Dr. Dicker said, we're gonna do this talk with the help of two of our trainees at the Program for the Advancement of Surgical Equity or PACE, uh, Dr. Lauren Eiler-Dang and Dr. Kevin Blair, and they are both rising stars and future leaders in global health. Um, together, we'll be presenting on inequity and trauma care in Sub-Saharan Africa, which we really think has a variety of opportunity for transdisciplinary collaboration. Here are our disclosures. So first, I'll give a brief introduction of trauma as a public health problem and then introduce a challenge our own team faced in working towards addressing it. And then I'll hand it off to Dr. Eiler Dang and Dr. Blair to describe how we approached its solution. The WHO estimates that nearly 6 million deaths occur annually from injury, which is 10% of the world's deaths and 32% more than the deaths from HIV, TB and malaria combined. 
And this is a growing problem. Three of the global leading causes of death are due to injury mechanisms, and road traffic injuries alone are projected to be the fifth leading cause of death by 2030. Contrary to what many people may think, 90% of these deaths occur in low or middle income countries. So this is a big problem and injury and mortality in Sub-Saharan Africa is among the highest in the world, but it is only increasing as countries industrialize. Although the burden of death and disability due to injury is enormous, less than 1% of global health funding currently goes towards injury research. As a trauma surgeon who was a Peace Corps volunteer back in my, in my 20s, I served in Senegal and West Africa, I became very interested in the public health approach to this surgical disease that is disproportionately impact, impacting Sub-Saharan Africa, but it's relatively underfunded and unaddressed. When I joined UCLA three years ago, HETS theme co-lead Dr. Rochelle Dicker, also a trauma surgeon, and I worked together to create the Program for the Advancement of Surgical Equity, or PACE. We have a multidisciplinary faculty, which includes surgeons from several different specialties, as well as core faculty with expertise in biostats, Dr. Alan Hubbard from UC Berkeley, and Dr. Sandy McCoy, who is an epidemiologist with uh, expertise in implementation science. Um, we have a portfolio of research projects that are broadly grouped based under U.S.-based and global health themes. Um, PACE's local work is led mainly by Dr. Dicker and focuses on violence prevention and intervention and whole person trauma care at the local and national levels. And we also have two uh, amazing uh, surgeons, Dr. Shonda Rebels and Dr. Jesus Uloa, who work on sur surgical outcomes disparities in the U.S. On the global health side, we have long-term partnerships in Cameroon, Uganda, and Armenia, each with a local director of research based in that country. And for this talk, we're gonna discuss the work with our partners in Cameroon led by Dr. Alain Shisham, with whom I've been collaborating since 2008. Cameroon is a Central African country and our primary partner there is the University of Buya, again, led by Dr. Alain Shisham, and he is the chief of surgery there and the vice dean for research there. He oversees several study supervisors and 11 research assistants right now uh, who all are the research infrastructure uh, for our partnership. The US partner is the Program for the Advancement of Surgical Equity uh, with our faculty and our amazing pro program managers. I wanna especially highlight Dr. Rashida Oke, who is uh, an essential uh, um, piece of our collaboration with Cameroon. and she really works closely with everybody. Uh, we also have a close relationship with the Cameroon Ministry of Public Health, which is important, and I'll get to that in a minute. It's led by Dr. Georges Tundi, who uh, has two, he's had two of their staff assigned as points of contact for our projects, uh, including Dr. Disac Delon, pictured here, who oversees our Cameroon trauma registries, which brings me to our, my next uh, topic here. When we first started collaborating in 2008, there was essentially very little available primary data on injuries in Cameroon. There were some modeling estimated, uh, estimates um, provided by the WHO, but that was really it. Now in the US, trauma systems development started with the initiation of trauma registries. Trauma registries are hospital-based databases uh, that consist of data on trauma patients that are abstracted mainly from clinical records and they include things like demographic information, injury mechanism and presentation, the patient's clinical course and clinical outcome. And in the United States, trauma registries were first instituted around 1970 in Illinois and rapidly expanded to the rest of the country, becoming an essential source of data for injury epidemiology. They helped provide data for trauma research. Uh, they helped guide resource allocation for trauma centers and really became the cornerstone of trauma quality improvement programs. Currently, all level one trauma centers, including UCLA, are required to submit data to the National Trauma Data Bank, a centralized repository for US trauma data. Ultimately, trauma uh, registries are really fundamental to the development of a mature, organized trauma system. Trauma systems organization and trauma quality improvement programs have been shown to increase survival in trauma patients, and ultimately, they both depend on data from these registries. Now, given the potential benefits of instituting trauma registries and the need for injury data in Cameroon, Dr. Shisham and I began in 2008 by creating a pilot trauma registry at a single hospital. 
Over the first years of our collaboration, we worked on refining the methods of data collection and the systems we had in place, and we published a few of the first studies in Cameroon on injury. And from the beginning, we did this in close partnership with the Ministry of Public Health, who we consider as my partner, Dr. Shisham says, the end user of our research. Now, one of the things the Ministry of Public Health was interested in tracking was socioeconomic status. In our first pilot trauma registry at the Central Hospital of Yaoundé, we used the standard methodology employed by the Demographic and Health Survey, or DHS, to track socioeconomic status. Now, because income is a very poor reflection of wealth in many low and middle income countries, this tool was designed to capture other resources such as land ownership and indicators of wealth such as what kind of fuel people use for cooking and where their water comes from. And then these are then used to estimate a wealth score for each patient. But as you can see from these forms, they're quite long. They're really difficult to implement in the acute trauma setting where you can imagine someone comes in pain and critically injured, needing urgent care. They're not really in the mood to answer 30 questions about whether or not they have a mosquito net and what kind of flooring they have in their house. Um, despite these challenges, we were able to collect data on almost 3,000 trauma patients over about six months in 2009 during our pilot experience. And this is what we found. Here, you can see our patient population, which is in gray, compared to the general urban population of Cameroon, which is in yellow. And these are using asset scores derived from the DHS uh, methods applied to our own trauma patients in Cameroon. And we found that overall, patients presenting for care were wealthier than the general urban, uh, urban population in Cameroon and were overrepresented in the wealthiest quintile and underrepresented in the poorest. And then when we looked at which patients may have sought care elsewhere first before coming to the central hospital, we again found that the poorest quintiles were overrepresented, meaning that poor patients more commonly sought care at home uh, or through traditional healers or smaller health clinics or posts before coming for definitive care at the central hospital. Despite this, when, we, when the, those patients did show up, we found that our poorest patients were more likely to be more severely injured as measured by several uh, injury score, severity scoring systems. And this held true in our regression analysis control for age, sex, and mechanism as well, where the poorest patients were over five times as likely to have moderate or severe injuries. And all of this supported that lower socioeconomic status was significantly associated with more severe injury. So we found that poor people were underrepresented in the hospital going population. This begs the question, are poor people not getting injured as much or not injured seriously enough to seek care? But we also found that poor people were more likely to seek care elsewhere first. And when they did come to the hospital, they were more likely to be severely injured. So all of this taken together for us really pointed towards a potential barrier to access to care. That is, we suspected that poor people had a higher injury severity threshold for seeking definitive care at the central hospital. Now, more recently in 2015, we were able to take what we'd learned from our early pilot trauma registry and implemented a centralized trauma registry at four hospitals of different sizes and different catchment areas and different populations that they serve um, in Cameroon. And the overall goal of this Cameroon trauma registry project is to inform national injury policy and guide trauma care quality improvement strategies. And again, our main partner and end user in this project is the Cameroonian Ministry of Public Health. And they, again, were interested in tracking SES. And you can imagine when you find a health disparity, the impulse is to try to fix it. And that requires measuring the disparity, developing and testing a potential solution, then measuring it again, implementing that solution more broadly, then measuring again. And you can see you require a feasible method of equity surveillance. And the problem is that in the acute care setting, such as trauma, the standard DHS methodology is just not feasible. We needed a way to measure it with much fewer questions. And that is the challenge I presented to Dr. Eiler Deng, who will next tell you how she attempted to solve it. Thank you, Dr. Juilliard. Can you see my screen? Okay, and thank you so much to Dr. Dicker and to all of you for having us here today. 
Um, so I'll talk about development of the economic clusters algorithm to address the problem that Dr. Juilliard has set up. Um, so as she discussed, we are hoping ultimately to create a safer and more equitable world. But in order to do that, we have to measure disparities in injury outcomes and access to trauma care to try to determine whether interventions aimed at decreasing those disparities are successful. And at the beginning of this project, these efforts were hindered by the lack of an appropriate metric of socioeconomic status. Um, so as Dr. Juilliard mentioned, um, many people advocate against using income in lower resource settings where important parts of the economy like subsistence farming or trade in goods and services might not be adequately captured by this metric. Some surveys use expenditures, but as you can imagine, in order to determine someone's economic status by the many different things that they could spend money on, you have to ask a lot of questions. Many surveys ask about occupation or education, and these are important aspects of socioeconomic status, but they measure something different than wealth. So we wanted a metric that was more specific to wealth and then to ask about education and occupation also. And then as Dr. Juilliard showed, um, asking all of the questions for the wealth index is simply not feasible in an emergency setting like the trauma bay. So this led us to conclude that there was a need for a new metric of economic status. When thinking about a new metric, it's actually an opportunity to think about what you would want in a metric of economic status. And we realized there are a lot of advantages to the DHS wealth index methodology. First of all, assets-based metrics are very commonly used. And the DHS has data for over 90 countries. And furthermore, that data is representative of the overall national population. So you know the proportion of people with certain assets in the overall population, and you can compare that to the proportion of people in your hospital, for example, who have those assets, to see if there are differences in who is able to come to the hospital for care compared to the general population. But because we couldn't use the overall wealth index, it gave us a chance to think about how these assets really relate to wealth. So the status quo is to develop a principal components analysis where you create a linear combination or weighted sum of these assets and use that index to define someone's wealth. But is that really how assets relate to wealth? We took a slightly different approach. First of all, recognizing that wealth is a very multi-dimensional concept. So I will represent three potential dimensions based off of assets questions the DHS asks using this cube. First, you might ask if someone has a cell phone or not, whether they have land for agriculture or not, and whether they have a car or not. But the way that these variables relate to wealth might not necessarily be linear. So for example, we might have a group of people who has no cell phones and no cars, indicating that they're an overall poorer group of people, but they do have land for agriculture because perhaps these are subsistence farmers and that is how they're providing food for their families. Then we might have a group who has cell phones indicating increasing wealth, but still no cars and no land for agriculture. And finally, we might have a group who has cell phones and cars indicating even greater wealth, and they do have land for agriculture because this might be a group of wealthy landowners. And so in this case, the way that agriculture relates to wealth is not linear because agricultural land is available to the poorest group and the wealthiest group, of course, in different quantities, uh, but not to the middle group. So it's a nonlinear relationship. And we wanted our model to be able to respect these kinds of relationships if they truly exist in the population. Our goal is to identify true population groups, that is groups of people with shared common asset profiles, while recognizing that there will be people with less common asset profiles and we still want to assign everyone to a group. Finally, the last challenge is we can only use a few assets because of the time constraints of this emergency healthcare setting. So our approach to this problem was to use an unsupervised K-metoids clustering algorithm. And I won't go into great detail unless you are curious, 
But the way this works is defining population metoids, which are representatives of common asset profiles in the population. Then individuals are assigned to groups based on the similarity of their assets to the assets owned by the cluster metoid. But remember that we can only consider a few assets, so we considered all possible combinations of four assets variables, and we selected the clustering solution with the combination of assets with the highest average silhouette width, where average silhouette width is a metric of how similar people are to other members of their cluster and how different they are based on their assets to members of other clusters. The output is then an economic clusters model based on few asset variables that define the most distinct economic groups in a given population. And this will be different for any population with DHS data. But I want to stress that methods development is a collaborative effort. We should not be sitting by ourselves in a room with our computers and not talking to anyone. So it's very important with a new economic metric that it is actually consistent with the local economy based off of the opinions of people who understand that economy. And also that it's practical and logistically feasible to implement so it can be used as a metric of economic status in a sustainable health equity surveillance system. So I had the opportunity to go to Cameroon in 2016 and speak with Cameroonian medical professionals and trauma registry implementers about our, uh, uh, sorry, about our initial ideas about these methods. And I would like to give a special thank you to Dr. Alain Shishom, um, who is the head of the Department of Surgery at University of Boya and just a fabulous person. Um, Dr. Fanny de Sac-Delon, um, who's an MD, PhD, and public health professional in Cameroon, Mary Magdalene Tanjong, who's one of the trauma registry research assistants, um, and Dr. Alfred Awa, who was a medical student at University of Boya at the time. Um, these and, and other people were extremely helpful. Um, and some of their feedback included that our initial model had a lot of groups and too many groups is just difficult to interpret. How do you actually act on this information? So our initial strategy was to start with more groups and combine them with hierarchical clustering, but we eventually settled on an approach of selecting the minimum number of clusters with an average silhouette width of greater than 0.7, because this is a commonly cited heuristic threshold um, for defining strongly distinct groups in a population. Then once we had an economic model for Cameroon consisting of relatively few groups, the next question is how do we interpret those groups? So this heat map shows uh, asset variables on the left, and then whether or not people in each cluster have those assets with no being red and yes being green. So just taking a big picture view, you might think that if you have two rural groups and one has cell phones and one does not, that the group with cell phones might be wealthier than the group without them. And similarly, you might think if you have an urban group with no cell phones, these might be the poor, but then if you have two groups who are urban with cell phones and one owns their homes and one rents, what does that actually mean in terms of the Cameroonian economy specifically? And finally, if you have an urban group with cell phones who cooks with a more expensive fuel source, liquid petroleum gas, does that truly mean that this group of people is wealthier? So I asked our Cameroonian colleagues these questions and they said, well, the best thing would just be to avoid a subjective interpretation. So we developed a method for objectively ranking the clusters based on health and social outcomes that are known to correlate with wealth. To see how this works, you can see on this graph that as we go from the poorer groups to the wealthier groups in both the rural and the urban settings, that we have a decrease in child mortality and an increase in women's literacy scores and child height for HZ score, which is a marker of malnutrition. So this provided a consistent ranking where it turned out the urban middle-class tenants had better outcomes on all three metrics than the urban middle-class homeowners. And this also confirmed our initial thoughts about the relative wealth of the other clusters based off of the assets that were available to them. 
And for Cameroon and the other countries we have done this for so far, unfortunately, these three metrics provide a consistent ranking. So we have an objective way of ranking wealth between our population clusters. Finally, we wanted to compare the economic clusters model to the wealth index based off of other variables that are known to be associated with health or healthcare. So this is our Ugandan model. And the DHS asks, where does your family seek healthcare? You can see for the economic clusters model, um, first of all, that the groups are of varying sizes indicated by the width of the bars on this graph. But as we know that the 1% of the economy is very different from the bottom 99% of the economy, we probably want to allow our groups to be different sizes if that is what truly exists in a population. In comparison, the wealth index has evenly sized quintiles by definition. Then we can see that the proportion of people in each cluster saying that they sought private healthcare is uh, has a greater difference between the poorest economic cluster and the wealthiest economic cluster compared to the difference in the proportion of people who seek healthcare at a private facility in the poorest wealth quintile compared to the wealthiest wealth quintile. So this suggests that with our method of defining the clusters and allowing them to be different sizes, we may be able to find even larger differences in things like healthcare seeking behavior. So the economic clusters model is currently being used in the Cameroonian National Trauma Registry and is coming soon to the Soroti Regional Referral Hospital General Surgery Registry in Uganda. And it is great to see that these clusters correlate with outcomes in a way we would expect in the DHS. But the next question is, how will these metrics perform when used for health equity surveillance in a trauma registry? So to answer that question, I will hand it off to Dr. Kevin Blair. All right, thank you, Lauren. Um, thank you to Dr. Dicker for the introduction. Uh, as she said, I am, uh, my name is Kevin Blair. I'm a general surgery resident at UCLA. And I'll be presenting one example of how we have applied the household socioeconomic status clustering to the national, uh, Cameroon National Trauma Registry data. So, I'll be presenting some of the results from a project in which we looked at social determinants of health as risk factors for violent injury in Cameroon. Now, this is just one of a number of projects where we've been able to implement the SES clustering uh, questions and clustering categorization into our analyses. Uh, but for this one, the background is that injury is increasingly viewed as a preventable disease. Dr. Juilliard laid this out very well in the beginning of the presentation. And specifically when we look at interpersonal violence related injury, things such as assaults or homicides, uh, there are a number of known modifiable risk factors, many of which are considered social determinants of health. Things such as education, employment, uh, socioeconomic status. And these are known to contribute to a variety of health conditions, uh, but in our case, we're focused on injury. And so with this project, we looked at describing associations between select social determinants of health and interpersonal violence related injury in Cameroon. The study population came from patients presenting to one of the four national trauma registry hospitals between October of 2017 and January of 2020. And for this question of interpersonal violence related injury, we chose to exclude children. And that left us with a total sample of 7,596 patients. Uh, for this study, our primary outcome was interpersonal violence-related injury, and we compared that against those with unintentional injury, things such as road traffic incidents. Uh, when patients come into the hospital on the data collection form, there is a question about intent. We chose to exclude those presenting with suicide or self-harm, since that's a very distinct type of injury, and that left us with a dichotomous outcome. Our key exposures were social determinants of health that are known in especially high income countries to be associated with violent injury. Uh, we looked at household socioeconomic status cluster, which Lauren just described very well for us, uh, in addition to education and occupation, uh, which she also mentioned were distinct 
and should be measured separately. And our covariates in our modeling were age, sex, hospital, and alcohol use. Now, before I get into the specific results, uh, or the results specific to interpersonal violence related injury, I want to share a few slides with some descriptive data of the clustering applied to our trauma registry data. So first, uh, again, our sample is 7,700 uh, patients age 15 or older. And here we see a breakdown of how they are grouped into the six clusters here on the left uh, with an additional grouping of missing. You see the number of patients and the percent of the total sample that fall into each of the six SES clusters. And for comparison, I've presented the breakdown in the DHS data set that was used uh, to initially create the clusters. And if you compare the two, uh, you see that similar to what Dr. Juilliard described earlier, uh, that the patients presenting for hospital level care, particularly at these urban or peri-urban hospitals, are per, are, have a greater percentage uh, of patients in the urban middle-class tenant and the urban wealthy SES clusters, uh, which as she presented earlier, we've described and we are currently working to understand this, this difference better. But even though the percentages are different than the general Cameroonian population, uh, on the next three slides, we have some surrogate markers of SES that, might, that help to demonstrate the internal validity of this measure. So first, when patients come to the hospital, one of the questions they're asked in the emergency department is whether or not the cost impeded the care that they needed uh, to receive. And so here on the bottom, you see the six SES clusters, and each percentage refers to the percent of those patients who said that cost impeded the care that they received. And here, as you would expect, we see a decreasing percentage as SES increases. And the highest percentage in the urban poor uh, cluster reported that care uh, cost impeded their care. Next, looking at occupation, we asked patients to report occupation. One of the categories is unemployed. And similarly, the percentages track with what you would expect based on socioeconomic status and the urban poor in particular have the highest level of unemployment. And lastly, uh, secondary or higher level education. Again, we see these percentages within each cluster tracking how you would expect. Um, so this is very encouraging and I hope that this shows you that there is internal validity to this measure, although it's not matching uh, the general Cameroonian population, uh, it's still capturing the differences between these clusters very well. So back to our question of risk factors for interpersonal violence-related injury. During this time frame, the 7,600 patients, 18% presented with an interpersonal violence-related injury and 82% with unintentional injury, uh, the most common of which is a road traffic injury. To give you a better sense of what interpersonal violence related injury is, uh, the majority are presenting after blunt assault, 30% uh, are presenting after a knife, stab, or cut wound, and 5% uh, in the urban Cameroon setting, setting present after firearm injury. So our question was, are social determinants of health that we know increase risk of violent injury in the US or in other high income settings? Uh, are there associations in the Cameroonian population? So this was a multivariate regression model adjusted for age, sex, hospital, and alcohol use. And the first of our key exposure variables were, was using the household SES cluster. And first I wanna point out that in this analysis, we chose to combine rural poor and rural wealthy clusters due to the small sample size of the rural poor cluster and recommendation from one of our reviewers. Uh, but here you see um, the odds ratios, adjusted odds ratios compared to the urban wealthy, the highest SES cluster. And you see strong evidence to suggest that patients who are in the rural clusters or the urban poor clusters have an increased odds of presenting with interpersonal violence related injury. Or said in another way, patients who come in with an interpersonal violence related injury, such as assault, a stabbing, or a gunshot wound, have increased odds of being from one of these lower SES clusters. We also included occupation as one of our key predictors. 
And when you compare to self-employed patients, uh, there is very strong evidence to suggest that unemployment increases the odds of having an interpersonal violence related injury. And lastly, when we look at education, our reference very, uh, category being university level education, uh, there's moderately strong evidence to suggest that primary or no formal education increases uh, odds of having interpersonal violence related injury. And so taken together, we see that all three of our predictors uh, have significant associations with the outcome of violent injury. But what do we do with, with these results, with these data? Uh, starting first with the specific question of risk factors for, for violent injury, it is important and uh, encouraging to see that we are able to identify similar associations between interpersonal violence related injury and social determinants of health as we see in high income countries. Uh, most of the publications and most of the data that have identified associations such as these have come from places like the United States, where there is well-established trauma registry data banks. Uh, but there is very limited data on injury epidemiology in general in sub-Saharan Africa, and especially on risk factors. Um, so this is an important first step to creating interventions. But identifying disparity in this question or any of the other ones uh, is not a solution. And we have ongoing work uh, at the community and the hospital level with quantitative and qualitative research, seeking to understand why we see these disparities and what potential solutions are. Uh, if anyone on the call uh, does work in injury prevention in the US, I know Dr. Dicker and Dr. Juilliard both do. Uh, an interesting question with this particular study is whether or not hospital-based interventions could work in a setting like Cameroon. Uh, in the U.S., uh, hospital-based violence intervention programs, or HVITs, are increasingly popular and are present in many trauma hospitals across the country. And the idea with these programs is to identify patients when they come into the hospital who are at high risk of having a recurrent or another violent injury, uh, using the time in the hospital as a teachable moment to connect them with resources, uh, to help reduce the risk of having an injury in the future and of dying of an injury in the future. Um, this is the mainstay or one of the mainstays of secondary injury, injury prevention work in the US, uh, but very few hospitals have attempted to implement these programs in low and middle income countries. And so it's an interesting area for future research. But more broadly, what are implications of using these S the SES cluster that Lauren described uh, in our work in Cameroon. Well, first, we saw in the association with mortality and education that uh, Lauren presented that there is consistency with other measures of health. And it's really encouraging with these data that I presented to see internal consistency with education uh, and employment. And so this is definitely something that we will continue to use and to uh, modify and improve with our Cam Cameroon data. And as we move forward, we'll be using this to explore barriers to accessing care, barriers to follow up, risk of injury, risk of poor outcomes. And ultimately, as we implement interventions, we'll be using this as a tool to measure impact. Uh, ultimately, this is one piece of many that uh, goes into working to achieve uh, health equity for our trauma patients in Cameroon. And with that, I'll pass back to Dr. Juilliard, who will finish up with some exciting next steps uh, with our collaboration. Hi everyone, thank you so much, Lauren and Kevin for such excellent uh, explanations of your work. Um, and thank you for doing the work, it's not easy and you guys have been doing an amazing job. Um, now I'd like to focus on what we have planned for the future. The data from this initial work on SES surveillance served as the preliminary data for one of two large five-year NIH grant propo proposals that were nested within our collaboration's research hub proposal for the new Data Science in Africa initiative, which the NIH recently put out. And uh, we are so grateful and happy that this was actually awarded, we found out in September. Um, and so with this funding, we plan to develop and validate economic
socioeconomic clusters for all 37 countries in Sub-Saharan Africa with available current DHS data <clears throat> and create a free platform with several tools that will allow researchers who are interested in health equity in Sub-Saharan Africa to use the algorithm in their own data and assign clusters to their study subjects so they can track equity issues in their own research. Uh, the DSI Data Science in Africa U54 opportunity is going to allow us also to create the Data Science Center for the Study of Surgery, Injury, and Equity in Africa, or Design Africa. That will be located at the University of Boya. And the goals will be to use data science to decrease the burden of injuries and surgical diseases through improved surveillance, like we were describing today, prevention and treatment and to improve equitable access to quality surgical care in Cameroon and ideally other Sub-Saharan African countries. The first project in this is based on the preliminary work we discussed today. And the second project is based on the work of another excellent trainee, Dr. Ariane Christie, who is a surgeon finishing her trauma fellowship right now. And she piloted a mobile phone-based survey to identify discharge trauma patients who need further care for their injuries. And we'll be using a data adaptive method to optimize this follow-up tool and hopefully be able to identify patients at risk for follow-up loss when they arrive at the hospital. And that way intervene early to try and retain them to formal care if they need it. The research hub is made up of three cores, an administrative core, which uh, is led by Dr. Alain Shisham, who is going to be the director of design uh, and then supporting faculty and staff. And then the data management and analysis core, the DMAT core is gonna govern data quality, um, provide method support to our hubs and projects, and then assist with setting up the long-term infrastructure at the University of Boya that will allow it to securely house large amounts of cloud-based and server-based data. And then we have a capacity building core, which will oversee training activities of Design Africa. And that'll include career development um, and methods training of our trainees in Sub-Saharan Africa, uh, as well as a seed grant program to support African investigators who are interested in exploring and researching our core themes. Um, these cores are gonna work together to support DESIGN's two large five-year research projects that I, I've already mentioned, as well as some future projects through the seed grant program that we're gonna have. Um, as well as in research initiated by the consortium, the DSI Africa Consortium is expected to have um, collaborative research projects coming up. And then and there are gonna be some new pilot programs that'll be spurred by our work. But in addition to these planned projects, what this opportunity is gonna allow us to do is allow for an unprecedented growth in infrastructure and training to push ahead trauma and surgical research in Cameroon and other countries in the region. The M Health project, project number two, is gonna involve scaling up our current hospital-based trauma registry, which includes four hospitals to 10 hospitals. And that'll provide the Ministry of Public Health in Cameroon with one of the largest multi-institutional trauma databases in Sub-Saharan Africa. And this can be leveraged by our trainees, by our, both in the US and in Cameroon and uh, investigators um, uh, and other researchers throughout Cameroon and other uh, partners through the DSI Africa Consortium to, to do their own research. Uh, the hubs and projects are gonna require the hiring, training, and long-term investment in approximately 30 new research staff, <clears throat> as well as the development of a robust data science hardware programs, networking, all of which will provide uh, trans real transformational infrastructure for future public health research at the University of Boya. And, We'll be training future scientific investigators by including fellows from Cameroon on each project and supporting emerging investigators with our seed grant program and a methods toolkit that's led by the capacity building core that'll include coursework on grant writing and scientific presentations, some of which is provided by UCLA CTSI through this mechanism. And those things are often the rate limiting steps for the leap to investigator independence. Our group is incredibly grateful to have this opportunity to be part of this incredible consortium and learn from all the other grantees. Um, and, but it also really dovetails nicely with another program we have planned, 
It's also supported through the NIH, uh, this time through a D43 trauma training grant. And that will allow us to strengthen the quantitative pipeline for trauma research training in Cameroon through our program, which we're calling the Sustainable Trauma Research Education and Mentoring or STREAM program. STREAM is gonna train a cadre of multidisciplinary trauma researchers, including two postdoctoral fellows who will ultimately have destination faculty positions at the University of Boya once they successfully complete their training with us. Uh, additionally, we will have MPH and PhD trainees throughout the grant cycle who will get their foundational degrees at the University of Boya, which will then be augmented by course offerings that have been curated from the UC campuses who are partners on the grant in addition to a team mentored trauma related research project uh, that will uh, include faculty from both the US campuses and the Cameroon partners. So the plan is for these postdoctoral fellows and some of the top PhD and MPH stream trainees to become the foundational faculty <clears throat> for the center so that they can oversee the research activities of the center and continue to train future generations of data scientists and trauma researchers in Cameroon. Our project started out in 2008 with small projects that allowed us to start amassing some data, uh, training some staff, uh, uh, building up some trainees. And now we're at this transformational moment where these projects can really coalesce around these two larger scale programs. And hopefully we can get these to work together to create a sustainable research center at Boya which been as, has been a dream of ours, uh, my partner, Dr. Shishoms, and our partners at Boyas for a long time, um, basically since we started working together in 2008. So the brief example of work we just gave um, required the collaboration of surgeons, biostatisticians, a health economist, public health officials, and as you can see, this type of work requires a true team. Some of our other projects have required the expertise of qualitative researchers, medical anthropologists, uh, a Cameroonian linguistics professor. These questions that we're asking are complex and really we have to have a, a real team to answer them. We have implementation scientists, epidemiologists, we need policy experts and others. It's really a team sport. Uh, PACE is really centered around a multidisciplinary core faculty. But one of the reasons I came to UCLA was because of the breadth and depth of diverse experience to be found here. And I wanted to end this talk by saying that we really would welcome anyone interested in these topics that we're exploring, who has a diverse academic background, to, to feel welcome to co collaborate with us. We would love to partner. Um, here are our references. And with that, I wanted to say thank you so much for allowing us for the opportunity to share some of our work today. And I'd especially like to thank my colleagues in Cameroon, Dr. Alain Shisham. Uh, Dr. Etundi and Dr. Manono, as well as the staff at the University of Boya and the Ministry of Public Health and our study research staff uh, who make all of this work possible. Uh, and with that, we'd be happy to take any questions. Great. Thank you so much. This was absolutely wonderful. And um, thanks to Ian. Um, we have the ability to have anybody ask questions out loud instead of doing the Q&A. Um, so I encourage any of you to, to um, ask questions of our panelists. Yeah, thanks so much, Ian, for doing that. It looks like everybody will have the opportunity. And, and in particular, Dr. Shichom is with us from Cameroon right now. So not to totally put you on the spot, but if you'd like to say something, Dr. Shichom, you are welcome to, as I think you're, you're your talking is permitted on, on our Zoom. Thank you, my, my, my very good friend, Dr. Rochelle. Uh, it, it's always good to, to talk to you. And I'm particularly uh, delighted to have Lauren and Kevin uh, on board. Uh, you guys had a, a, a really great, great talk. Uh, it's really uh, reflecting what we've been doing in Cameroon. Uh, all I want uh, everybody to know is that there is something that is really happening in Cameroon right now. Uh, and it's only going to get better and better, uh, especially with uh, what we just secured, uh, as Catherine told you, we just secured uh, a huge opportunity of shifting from the minor things that we've been doing so far to big data stuff. 
So it's going to change. It's going. It's a game changing opportunity that we've just got uh, right now. And uh, when you combine it with the other uh, capacity building opportunity that we got, uh, I think we were making some uh, progress, and we hope to be able to make an impact not only from uh, for Cameroon. But for all African countries, just imagine that uh, we are able to develop, based on the work by uh, Lauren and Kevin, we are able to develop uh, a kind of tool that permits us to assess uh, social economic status in more than 35 African countries. I, I think that's really going to have an impact on uh, nearly everything we are doing here uh, in Africa in terms of, uh, of, of medical research. And I'm getting more and more excited as we move forward. Uh, and I'm happy to have young people like Lauren and uh, Kevin on board who are going to, to, to take the relay and continue uh, helping us advancing everything. So congrats to all. Particular thanks to my friend, Catherine Julia, Julia my, my partner in, in crime, as she often says. <laughs> <laughs> It was a great, uh, great presentation. I've been uh, on board uh, from the beginning. I listened to each uh, and every bit of what was said here. And uh, thanks so much. I'm, I'm very excited. I'm, I'm, I'm happy to be on board. Thank you so much, Dr. Shichom. And um, I'm assuming it's the middle of the night because I don't think you sleep ever. So thank you for being with us. <laughs> Um, oh, well, it's just 10 p.m. It's not oh. that late. <laughs> <That's all. laughs> um, I see a hand of Dr. Akarele. Would you like to um, make a comment or question? Hi, Dr. Dicker. Oh, I'm not a doctor. Oh, I'm yeah, you are. <laughs> Everybody is. <laughs> um, <laughs> but thank you so much for this presentation. It just goes to show, like, I think looking at this work is not something that was done overnight. And like you've put so much effort into it, not only maybe this year, but it seems like several years of dedication to this project. I'm just curious, um, two questions. What advice do you have for, um, uh, what advice do you have for individuals to kind of like, you know, stay encouraged or quite challenging? Um, quite challenging circumstances and environments and making systemic change in global health plus um like especially doing that in an environment where um there may be p political instability such as like francophone anglophone um nuances and that type of thing that's a really good question i mean and i've really curious to hear what Dr. Shisholm has to say if he's willing to answer it as well. I, I know from my part, from the U.S. perspective, you know, it was very helpful to me to be a Peace Corps volunteer for three years and realize how hard it is to understand the environment, the community, perspectives, all the, I mean, it just takes, a, it takes a lot of time. And I think I was lucky that I was dis disabused early and brutally of any vision I had that I was going to save the world because it's just not easy. And so that was a very good lesson for me. Living someplace and having low expectations and just listening was, was the key for the beginning for me. And then the other key is finding a partner like Dr. Shisham. And I, I, we, we work with several other people who are also incredibly inspirational and, and, just watching their determination and their consistency, I can't let myself get discouraged. And we have had setbacks and frustrations. I mean, we have them all the time. It is not for the faint of heart. Global health work is really challenging. And it's, it's kind of like, I have a slide <laughs> that I give when I give a talk sometime of all my failed grant opportunities. And it's like this, you just have to keep showing up, you know, you just have to keep going. And I, I, I would think about um, some of the people I lived with in Senegal and, and the incredible challenges they faced. And if I can't just keep showing up, like, then I'm, I need to go home. You know, like, it's not, it's not a lot to ask of somebody who's been born into privilege, I think, to just keep trying. But I agree, it can be extremely, extremely discouraging. And I'm, I'm curious, I don't know, if Dr. Shishom, I don't want to put you on the spot. And I want to be mindful of it being 10pm. But I'm curious if you no, have no. comments on that. It's okay, Catherine. I'm, I'm fine. The first thing I want to do is uh, join you to say the most important thing uh, based on, uh, I mean, the most important thing about the question that uh, our colleague uh, asked there is, uh, I join you to say, keep moving. 
That, that is the first thing. Keep moving. Whatever might be happening around, make sure that every day you, mo- you make some progress, uh, you move forward. That's important. Now, uh, coming back to the question specifically, I believe uh, the, the, I look at it from two angles. The first one is, uh, no matter the uh, socio-political uh, situation, the environment is challenging. And we are talking about, when we talk about global surgery, we are talking about uh, trying to do everything we can to make sure that people everywhere in the world have access to quality surgical services. And I want to combine it with anesthetic services. That, that's what it's all about. Uh, and the only way when you look at the gap in terms of infrastructure, in terms of uh, human resources, and in terms of all, all, all different aspects, the only way we can address that, that is to define is by defining two sets of standards. Two sets of standards. We need to adapt what is considered gold standards elsewhere to uh, the conditions of, uh, of practice that we are having here. And that's what I've been doing for the past uh, 15 years or so, doing everything to adapt what is considered standard under uh, ideal conditions, what is considered gold standard, to adjust it to the conditions of practice with a, with a, with a, with a limited setting. Uh, that impo- it implies acquisition of data because uh, wherever, no matter from what angle we take it, it's, it, it always takes us down to the same issue, data, acquisition of data. And, and that takes me to the second angle when I want to look from it. Uh, you know, in Cameroon, we also have some challenges right now in terms of social, political uh, uh, status and, and all, all those things, and specifically about... Uh, uh, Anglophone and Francophone, English speaking, French speaking, uh, and, and all those things is extremely challenging. Uh, to me, it's still another opportunity uh, to acquire data, look into specific situations, define objectives, uh, still with the aim of making sure that every day we move forward in terms of uh, providing those who are working under such conditions with data that they may need to be able to guide their decisions. Uh, Not only those in the field, but also decision makers, uh, providing decision makers with data that can guide policy, especially under such conditions. I hope this helps. Thank you so much. Uh, any other comments? We have a we have three minutes left. Any other comments or questions before we get last thoughts from our distinguished panelists? I have a comment. Can you? Yes, hear? yes please. Yeah, uh, regarding Armenia, it's, it is uh, uh, the center of conflict of a civilized nation surrounded by uh, savage uh, neighbors, and they are having conflict at multiple levels. So the world should intervene to teach to behave properly all parties concerned because they are angry of each other. And by the way, they are uh, their ideology is savage, destructive. That is uh, the origin where the uh, where they came from central uh, China, they came to this area as Armenia, as the first Christian nation, the world should be proud of them. As far as Africa is concerned, I'm, I, now I'm coming to Africa. I, I, I'm Armenian, by the way. Africa is also having conflicts, neighboring conflicts. It, Africa is one of the oldest uh, humans there. I mean, the origin they came from there, the humanity. The point here is that these conflicts, I mean, if you take Ethiopia or, uh, or other conflicts, uh, Kenya and all that had their conflict. The same thing is being repeated in, in, in more civilized region, that is Armenia, surrounded by uh, historic uh, savagery. Okay, go, uh, as far as health is concerned, uh, when the, there is political conflict, there is health conflict. I mean, the political conflict will flood the uh, health. Indeed, yeah. we we just have uh, we just have a few seconds left, Doctor or uh, uh, Mr. Oh. Yannickian, Doctor oh. Yannickian. We're having a little trouble hearing you, so I'm going to 
just quickly pass it back over to our, our panelists for final thoughts. Okay, thank you. Uh-huh. Hi, everybody. Um, I just want to really thank everyone uh, for listening and for all your questions and your enthusiasm. And I also want to thank uh, Dr. Dicker um, and the CTSI and, and the health equity uh, theme for translation and social sciences. I really appreciate your, your invitation. And especially I want to thank our Dr. Shishon for showing up, even though it was 10 p.m. in Cameroon, but I shouldn't be surprised. He's always showing up, like he says. Uh, and, <laughs> and Lauren and Kevin for, for your excellent work as always. So thank you all so, so much. Thank you very much. And thanks to the CTSI, Ian, Lucy, thanks very much. We'll see you all next time.